Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the things you put on my heart. You are a faithful God. Prepare their hearts, oh God. Okay? In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> um, how was your week? Peaceful, no conflict, no warfare, correct? Do not lie in the house of God. <laughs> did you ask a question? Doing? You didn't ask, did you, Dan? <laughs> it really helps, um, Pastor, to know that no matter how times, many times I tell you, you don't do what I tell you. So it brings a lot of peace and confidence in me. <laughs> I'm not looking at you, Amy. I'm, I know that you do, okay? Because you keep Mike in line, okay? <laughs> so, um, it was an interesting week for me. It was a good week. I saw the good things of God. <clears throat> but he's been working on me. And... Um, There's a point when God tells you something and you say yes, but your whole heart isn't it. He knows it. And I've said yes to this many times, but he knows my heart really isn't it. And so I'm praying for the message this morning because I didn't have it. It was just been... Three days of fun. <laughs> he told me to repent to you. Now, I don't like that part of the sermon. Okay. Because I thought it would be my job to get you to repent to God, but he told me to repent to you since I repented to him. <clears throat> I told the story before. Everyone knows I had a son by the name of Joshua John. Died 1994. And there's a lady that some of you don't know, but some of you do, named Renee Day. Came here for years, moved to the Bay Area. First Vegas, now Bay Area. And one day she handed me an envelope with a letter in it. And she said, when you're ready, read it. So I stuck at my desk, and I waited, and I read it. And she gave me, as she would only say, a word from the Lord. And in that word, she told me to change my name. And I go, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. And it's going to be really painful. At the end, she told me what I would be called. And <clears throat> it was a tough thing for the family to hear. Uh, and so I kind of said, oh, yeah, sure, and didn't really dive into that word. And then, not long ago, I told you again I needed to repent of that word, but I still hadn't wholeheartedly dove into that word. So there's a way of hearing a prophetic word and shake your head yes, but your heart's going, really? Okay? So then you try to qualify it in your behavior, that in your behavior, so that you think you're doing it, but you're really not. And through some circumstances I went through this week, which I can't speak totally a lot about, he brought it to me again this morning. And it started with my friend, who never misses a beat, yesterday told me again, um, Baptist Prophets are very dangerous to hang out with. <laughs> <clears throat> and years ago, I was invited to preach at a conference in the Bay Area. It was all black churches, and I was the only white pastor there. And I was sitting on the couch in the hotel with the pastor who invited me, and 
I had been doing ministry, and he says, you're a Moses. You're a Moses. And I brought that up to my friend yesterday, and he said, no, why don't you go by what God called you? <laughs> I'm glad you guys are enjoying this, <laughs> but you don't know what I'm preaching, so have your good time right now. I'm, I'm step into the joy right now. And so he goes, and why don't you just accept once and for all that you're Joshua. So I'm standing before you. You don't have to call me anything. You, you call me whatever you call me. But I'm going to change my business cards. I'm going to change the website. And in parentheses, I'm going to put Joshua. And I didn't need the guy in the back row with a fist say, finally. <laughs> <laughs> So I did what God told me to do this morning. Now I'm going to do what he's telling me for you. Last week, remember, I think I told you that I saw how much grace is in heaven and the warfare that God sees over the Lamb. And it's fitting that I thought I should have a real loving, upbeat Mother's Day message that would encourage mothers. It will if you're a mother. Because mothers just want to do everything for their kids. I think most of them who are good mothers, as I gave a word to some, a mother today, that I think she needed to hear at the moment. Is that true? Okay. Was the word true? Okay. So you better walk in it. And so mothers have a heart that's different than guys. Okay? Especially women. We're task-oriented, they're nurturers, they have a soft tender, and even though the culture is falling apart, most mothers will do anything for their children, okay? And that's part of God's heart. He made man, he made woman, and we're made in his image, and we reflect on both sides who he is. He is a warrior. He is a provider. He is all those things. But he's also a nurturer and, and, and one who comforts and one who stands in the gap for the broken and the weak like a child. So today's message is called The Lord is Jealous for His People. And we will look at the Word. Oh, it went away. And then I will share with you what I believe the Lord wants to do with this church and with you and you at home. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Zion. With great zeal, with great fervor, I'm zealous for her. Now, in most translations, that word is jealous. Okay? Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord, the host, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets on Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand because of a great age. The streets of a city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, it is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people these days. It will be also marvelous in his eyes, says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the land of the east, I will, of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. There's something interesting. He kept saying, in the name of the Lord, 
he was making a point as a prophet. This is not my words. These are coming from the Lord himself for you, Israel. Now, some of this prophetic took place during Zechariah's time. But when you listen to that passage, he is jealous. He is jealous for you. Scripture says that a husband can be jealous for his wife. It is his. He has a right to be jealous and to keep other critters away from her. Okay? And so with that being said, do you understand? That's how God feels about you in this house right now. He's jealous for you. Well, we know that he's our husband, and we're He's the bridegroom. He's jealous. That word means to be zealous, filled with zeal, full of emotion, to be passionate, also to be jealous or envious, to be highly possessive of something. Hear that? He's highly possessive of something. And it's us. He wants you to know how much he is after you. And how much he sent his son to die on a cross. That's how much he's after you. And after he has you, he doesn't stop this passion for you. Now, the enemy comes and brings all this stuff over the top of us that says we must perform to be loved. We have to do right. We have to work hard. We can't receive grace. No, he's passionate. He's jealous for your attention. See, when he wants us to spend time with him, it isn't because he's trying to bring a, a heaviness over us. He wants to have time with you because he's passionate for you. Think about that. Religion tells you to do it in a work way. And when you've done the work, you're good enough. But if you do it that way, one day you don't do it, then you're not good enough. But if you understand his heart for you, is he's passionate to be with you. So when you sit down with him, when we come into the house of God to worship, it brings joy to him because he's coming to meet with you. That's why the enemy is so good to say, oh, you don't need to be there every week. Oh, you know, God understands. Yeah, he understands you're not passionate for him as much as he's passionate for you. When you're listening to the world talk about marriage, well, you know, I fell out of love. I fell out of passion. See, that's a worldly way of thinking. God isn't worldly. He's made us to be passionate in everything we do. He doesn't want you to be, oh, well. No, go after whatever he's put in your heart to be, to be passionate after it. Because he's a passionate driven God to spend time with us. See, he wants his people. And so this week, I do things that you guys, I pray never will have to do. I'm going to be blunt. I pray you never hear the things I hear in ministry. I don't even tell my wife what I hear. And I've been hearing it for 20 years plus. And the church overall, if I would put out there on a website, the church would say, this guy's nuts, he's crazy, he's making crap up. It isn't like that in America. We're civilized. That might be in Africa or the Middle East, but not America. So I don't want you to ask me what I hear. I rejoice that you don't get to hear it. God bless. You got another one? Okay. Usually she does too, so. Okay. So. Because I hear this, and God has given me a gift not to live in what I hear. Okay? So in other words, maybe it's my brain's not big enough to deal with it. I don't know. 
But like, I'll leave ministry and it's gone, pretty much. I carry it for a while. But something happened different this week in a couple of things. One, sometimes I, my Scottish temper does come up and I desire to kill people for what they do to people. I repent. Okay, I have repented many times when I hear somebody did what to you? See? And the human side comes up and the human side does not bring righteousness. God brings righteousness. Something happened to me this week was different. In my anger, I felt I was trembling inside. And I said, Lord, what's going on? It's my anger. You're feeling. I went, ooh. And I trembled for about a half hour. And I had just started looking at the passage, and he's jealous for us. God is a long-suffering God. Can we just say amen to that, please? In all that we do and don't do, he's long-suffering to bring us back to where we're supposed to be. So he's always waiting. Everybody goes, why doesn't God? Because he doesn't want to miss anybody. He wants everyone because of this passion he has for his creation. He doesn't want to lose anyone to hell. Okay, I love in Ezekiel. He doesn't rejoice in bringing judgment. Okay? But this anger came up in me, and it was like, I'm done. I'm done with what they are doing to my people. I'm done. Okay. So I went home, but I was my wife. You Okay. Are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm okay. Thursday night, you okay? Yeah, oh, I'm okay. Don't lie to your wife. <laughs> Friday, you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Friday afternoon, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. Friday night, you okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I had something that didn't like me hanging around. I think a lot of times I'm a nice guy. I don't know why something would hate me so much, but it did. And Friday morning, I got up to have my prayer time, and for the first time in a long time, I wept and wept and wept. And I'm crying out to God. You've got to stop evil men. You've got to stop the evil men. You've got to stop the evil in my city. You've got to stop it, God, as I'm weeping and crying. And then I said a statement, which I can't back away because I said it to a guy that never forgets anything. Whatever you want me to do unto death, I will do. I want it stopped. Well, that increased this warfare in a way. And I want sympathy. It was my prayer time. It was my God. And God has called me to be a Joshua to deliver the land. And when he told me today about Joshua, he was going in. And you're ready. They knew they were going, but he didn't know if anybody's going to follow him. He brought that in my heart today. He watched him buck Moses, the prophet. So why did Joshua even think they were going to follow him? He had to have a feeling like, okay, we're crossing the river. We did this at the Red Sea. And they were all excited about being delivered. Then they said, no, we ain't going to go fight. 
So when he said, I want you to be a Joshua, we look at him being a warrior and, and taking the land. But he had, to, he had to go with one person and one person only, the Lord. Every one of us can only fight a fight, and it's only with one person, the Lord. But we look for each other to hold each other up. But if we go to him first, he will be the one that will lead you into battle because he says in Scripture, the battle belongs to me. And the reason the church is not winning the battle is because the Lord is battling and we don't want to fight. The news media is overwhelmed with this Ukrainian army that shouldn't boast to do anything, and they're winning because they want to fight, because they know what loss means. They have been under the Soviet Union. They know they'll lose their churches. They know they'll be beat up, killed, and destroyed if they don't obey the dictator. So over and over again on the newscast, I mean, this little army, I mean, they're standing up to the second largest army in the world. But, but the day before the war started, they're on their knees saying, God save our nation. So I look at the Lord, who's encouraging men who may not even know him to fight. So where is our fight? Where is it? Have you seen any? I mean, I'm watching all the little kids at the altar. And they're having fun, and they're talking, and, but they want to be here on the stage. Now, some of the boys were being boys, and the girls were being girls more gentle. What was going on? Have you heard that the schools in Tehama County aren't doing well? Have you heard that at all? Hmm. Have you heard that our county services can only do so much because they have too much to do, from adult all the way down to children? Did you hear that kids are being abused and they can't take care of all of them because they have to pick and choose, hoping they pick right because they have too many who are being called in? We have kids dying in car wrecks and ODs all the time. And we know because we're upset as Christians. Our country. I listened to a man yesterday. I went to a funeral of a pastor who served for 74 years in our city. And this man outside, I won't mention his name, was talking to me and, another, and, and Joe. And he, they're taking our freedom. They're ta and all he wanted to talk was politics. I'm going, shut up. <laughs> shut up. They ain't taking nothing. We give it away. Why? Because we're not at war. Did you feel the presence of God today in worship? I did. Did you know when you worship God, the presence of God comes? Guess what happens when the devil is worshipped? His presence comes. That's what Lord put in my heart this morning. Amen. And so we have a city that sits under something because the church isn't doing it. It isn't the devil's more powerful. It's the church. We have the Lord on our side. We sang the songs. When Joey did that new, I think it's a new song, about Moses doing this and Mo, this one doing that, and the Lord does this, and, and I'm getting all excited, and he never changes, and he'll do it now. And I'm thinking, oh, thank you for that song. Because everything he did before, he wants to do now. Everything he did before, he wants to do now, church. Uh, every time he wants to pour out his Holy Spirit, he wants to do it again now. He wants to bring revival now, because he, he did it then. He hasn't changed. We have. Happy Mother's Day. 
You know what people get fired up over in that war is children being killed. Women being raped. Now they've got videos of children being raped in war. Is America riled up? Hell no. You know why? Because it ain't my yard. You know who's riled up? The God of heaven. Why? He's zealous for his people. He's zealous against evil. He hates it. And he's asking a people called by his name to have his passion. He's calling on us to know that I am jealous for you and I'm going to restore everything one day. See, when he prophesied in this passage about old men and old women and young kids, you know, those are the first ones that die in war. Okay? So what he was saying is, remember Jerusalem when, when Nebuchadnezzar overran us and the children and the old people died? I'm telling you, it's going to be so good here that they're going to grow old and the kids are going to be safe. Here it is, safe in the streets. Are our kids straight safe in the streets? Are they grabbing them and trafficking them? What is with us? Have we given up because it looks too big? Has the darkness puffed himself up so much we think this is how it has to be? So we do our religious thing. We do what we're supposed to do. And we feel comfortable when we shouldn't feel comfortable at all. So when I was crying on Friday morning, crying, shaking, it's got to stop. I'm done, God. And boy, I had a visitor show up. And he's walked by me ever since. And it wasn't Jesus. And every time I turn to go after it, he's there pushing at me. And I'm kind of excited because I have a prayer partner and I talk to him about it. He goes, well, that's good. That means something's going on good. If the snake, if snake wants to bite, it means you kicked him. That's not how the church thinks. As soon as it gets difficult. Oh, God, why do we go through this? We don't want to see evil. We don't want to see what evil does. We want to know what it does. We want to pretend like we live in fairy tale land. As you drive in the north, north of Maine, it says, a great place to live. Red Buff. There's a road you can't drive down <laughs> without getting an alignment once a week. But it's a great place. They want you to believe it's a great place. When schools are failing, Kids are failing, abuse is up, death is up, drug addiction's up, everything's up, but they don't want you to know that because it's okay. Church, go to sleep. Thank you, Lord. He brought something back to my mind. In the 70s, there's a man who had a vision. Ever watch that cartoon? They've changed it now, but when I was little, Gulliver Travels. Remember Gulliver, the one that little people tied up? Yeah. And they staked him down and, okay. Some of your people, have you guys seen that? Have you? Okay. <laughs> you haven't? Oh, she lives in Arizona. So. <laughs> they don't have that one down there. And in it. <laughs> So this guy had a vision of the Central Valley, okay? 
And in the Central Valley, he saw this giant laid out. And he stretched from the north of the valley all the way down to the south of the valley, which would be Porterville and Bakersfield. Okay? And in this vision, he goes, Lord, who is the giant? And he says, it's my church. But it's asleep, yes. And he says, every time she wakes, starts to wake up, the demons come and rub his face and puts the church back to sleep. That was in the 1970s. So, there's a pastor's wife in town. Uh, it's probably been five, seven years ago, maybe. They had a church, and they have a prayer time, and she said, God, why won't people in our church come pray? What's going on? And she has a vision of a giant. Now, she didn't know the vision. And he says, yeah, every time the church wakes up, Demons run the church's face and goes back to sleep. I think it was chance that that vision was renewed by a pastor's wife and ripoff. You think God is a God who throws dice and says, by chance, I'll just do it here or there? Or is he a God who has a purpose and a plan and he never deviates from it? So, I pray on Tuesdays and Thursdays with a man named Glenn, who was a head guy at Department of Water Resources. He goes to Grace Community, Pastor Paul's church, and we pray every Tuesday and Thursday. And Brian's here. And he's a geologist by trade. That's where he graduated in. So I said, technically, could you tell me where the head of the North Valley stops and where it changes geographically in other words st something you might know by education because <laughs> see everybody says it's supposed to be ready where the revival is going to be you know I mean it's a big town guess where the valley ends Technically, right here. Because as soon as you start to go up Nine Mile Hill, that's a different change. And they consider that now is the end of the Central Valley, and that way north is mountainous. We are the head of the giant, the church. And if the head doesn't wake up, the body don't wake up. <laughs> Have you ever had a long nap and you try to wake up and your body just doesn't know what to do? Or if you're at 69 years of age and you have to get up two or three times a night to visit parts of the house? <laughs> okay? You pray that you're totally awake before you walk into a wall? Because without the head woken up, the body doesn't respond. And so what if the enemy knows the prophetic word for California and he knows he only has to take out one place? He would, would he, if I was a commander of an army, why would I fight for the feet or the hands or even the heart? I'd take out the head. Hmm. That's interesting. Pastor, we're red buff. What can we do? What can we do that's going to stir the whole state of California? What can we come on, Pastor? Have you seen? We can't get the same people here three weeks in a row. I wonder why. How y'all doing?
pastor. I know you've been delivered of drugs and alcohol, but maybe some of them drugs haven't left your body after 30 years, and you're hallucinating about what God wants to do. Maybe. Or maybe not. If you knew all the gory freaking details I know about this city, you would know I'm right. If you knew all the things I see in the Spirit, you would know I'm right. If you had, my wife has said this, I think, but I probably have. Maybe I should give you my warfare for one week. Can we have a congregational vote on that? I'm not seeing hands going up. There's nobody wants to have what I go through. Hmm. Don't blame you. But you know why I enjoy it? Because where the battle of the Lord is, I'm in it, and I'm with the Lord. And what you haven't understood is how you sit on the sidelines and think you got it tough, the best place to be is right on the front line with Jesus because that's where he is. Because he hates evil. He hates wicked men doing what they're doing. He hates sex trafficking. He hates drug addiction. He hates broken homes. He hates sin. He hates it. He's not a passive God. Not at all. So why is the church passive? Go to sleep. Take it easy. But we wake up when we need something, don't we? God, I need a job. God, I need brain. God. And you come through. Why? Because he's jealous for you. He's so passionate for you. He can't, he can't change. I wonder what it would be like if a church chose after that passion. There it was. He's right there. Go in the name of Jesus. He's afraid of that. Did you know the big, bad boogeyman is afraid of you? You know why? Because you have a big, bad Jesus in you. And he's so afraid, you might recognize how big and bad he is. You sang about him today. Maybe we'll have Joey Amanda and do that song one more time. Yeah, he, he was then. He is now. He was then. He is now. We sang it. Do you believe it? Or were you just enjoying the moment of his presence? It is so good to be in his presence. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> At first, I was really upset with the Lord about bringing this message on Mother's Day. You know what he said? Well, go ahead. Get some mothers ticked off. You might see something happen. <laughs> I've had people come to me now with three different dreams this week of children being killed. Three dreams. You hear me? Children dying in their dreams. People I know. Just by chance. No. The big bad boogeyman scared. He's afraid there might be some mothers who get mad. And if mothers get mad, as there's a movie that somebody likes, if a mother gets mad, she's an neck, but she can turn the head. So men, look out. Maybe they're going to start turning some heads. Maybe they're going to be the ones that are going to lead it out. I'm excited. I forgot about announcements. I'm going to make one major announcement. I have had a burden to do something in this city for almost 10 years. And two Sundays ago, I gave a word to Dan Barry to stir him up. 
and ask, are you going to do what God told you to do and pick up your guitar? And he did. And I said, this is what I want you to do. I don't want to hear any more about social workers all wanting God and want to change the community. The best thing you could do is we bring them here one day a week and pray. Because I've had a burden for a noontime prayer of the business people of our community who really care about the community, who say they love Jesus, to come and pray for an hour a, a week. Just one hour and call on our city to be different. Because you know what? Business people are most concerned about what's in their back pocket. They might really enter into prayer. God, come, do something about our city. Our businesses are failing. We're oh, we, you know, God knows how to get us jealous for something. So on Wednesday at 11.30 to 12.30, Dan is encouraging some people from social services to come pray. And pray, we have two people in our church who have applications and interviews with social services that might get hired. And if they get hired, then we have maybe four people coming from there. And there may be more than that. And then I'm going to contact other people in the city who say they're Christians and ask them if they want the city changed. And my heart is, I don't have to be here. I don't want to be here. I want them to come and pray. And there's fruit with that because in... 1856, I believe. Maybe the historian back here could help me. A bunch of businessmen in New York City decided to start to pray, and within one year they had a thousand people praying in New York City, and they had a great revival. I'm watching God do things. I'm watching God give favor to the fusion ministry and open up doors to where their people can get on campus now and they know they're a Christian organization and they're inviting them in because God is done with the enemy and he wants somebody to wake up and watch what God is doing so he can get on. So he's going to stir up social services. He's going to stir up high schools and junior highs and God wants to move. He don't need an army. He needs a heart that knows he can do it. That's all. One heart. So I'm thinking about this, and as a pastor encouragement, okay, how's this work into an altar call? Well, you know what? I don't want you really to do it unless you're serious because I'm going to give you some scriptures about what happens when you think you want something and don't do it. Ooh, ooh, this is the tough part. This was added on that was not in your overheads. So we all get worked up. Come on, mothers, we're going to fight for our homes. We're going to fight for our kids. We're going to fight in prayer. Watch what you think. So I'll give you a scripture how God... Looks at things. Would that be okay? Okay. It's in Scripture. It's in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or the physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for the man looks at the outer appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He's talking about King David. He had all these big brothers who were buffed. And here's this little ruddy kid who took care of sheep. And they went down to each brother. No, not that one. No, not that one. No, not that All the way down. Now in the number eight. Yeah, that one. Can you imagine the brothers? What? I'm, I can beat him up. So, so God says, I look at the heart. So everything I'm preaching to you, if you're going, oh, this is good, Pastor. You're right. We could take the city and we can do Well, watch it now. So he says in Chronicles 28, verse 9, Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the assembly of the Lord, oh, wrong one, verse 9, 
As for you, my son Solomon, I know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal, loyal heart and a willing heart. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of your thoughts. We're screwed. <laughs> if we seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Now, how would you like to be made king and have that told to you? I knew your daddy's heart. It was after me. And you can say what you want, Solomon. You can act any way you want. You can put on the show, but I know your thoughts and the intent of them. Hmm. I'm not working into a good altar call here. So you go, okay, Pastor, we're under grace. We're under grace. We are. So what does Jesus say about this? Oh, I thought you were leaving. Okay. Well, hey. <laughs> At that moment after I said, God knows your thoughts and you get up to go to the back, I didn't know. I know you had to have some, some energy drink. I know. I know you're addicted. It's okay. God will deliver you one day. You know, I can tell when the young ones come in. Because see, when I'm worshiping, this glass here, it reflects. And I see hands going to the table, putting down their drinks. <laughs> I go, some young ones are coming in. So how did Jesus handle this? You know what I'm saying? And this has always been one of my favorite verses that keeps me from going crazy. John 20. John chapter 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, and they saw signs and wonders he did. Oh, I go, yeah, I've been there. I've seen tumors removed, legs grow. We've seen a man who's supposed to die. Oh, we've seen allergies go, food allergies. Man, oh, I've seen him, Lord. We're going to have revival. Verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. Verse 25. And had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. It's a good thing pastors meditate on that verse. Because if I had... Just $10 for every word that the sheep have told me over 20 years. We definitely would be retired on the coast <laughs> with a big house. Easily. If I had a dollar for every time I ran into someone at Walmart that said, I'll see you Sunday, Pastor. I've been really busy. Don't tell because you're not talking to me. I'm not God. I just work for the guy. I show up on Sundays because he hired me. <laughs> when you tell God I'm going to be here and you don't make it, the enemy goes, oh, sure, see, God doesn't care. He knows you don't care, and he starts beating you up. That's why he says, quit making your vows that your yes be yes, you know we know. Just do what you're supposed to do. Don't even talk about it. Just do it. See, so my heart would be on this Mother's Day that I'm telling you, I believe God's about to do something. I believe that God is about to, he is, what if he's fed up? What if his cup is full of seeing wickedness done to people? Seeing families destroyed? I didn't share this on Sunday, but it's been three weeks ago. A young girl, very beautiful girl who works at, at Vista, came to me, sent me a private message, Pastor, pray for my friend. She's dying. Her liver's gone. She's septic. So I started praying. 
And Tuesday night, she came in, and I, I got next to this girl and asked her some questions, and she told me her life, and it was just sad. She didn't deserve grace in how she lived, but none of us do. And I said, okay, I'll keep praying. And the Lord rebuked me. He's been getting me a lot, which is good. That means he cares. It means I got hope to see what I've been waiting for. He said, you're going to pray, but are you praying with the hope of believing? Because the doctor's ready to unplug her. She's dying. Her whole body was septic. She's not going to make it. There's no way. So after I leave this young lady and her smile and that she covers everything up well with, and <laughs> the Lord says, are you really going to pray? Are you really going to believe? I got re rebuked, and then I said, yes, I will. So I called her forward, and Mike and Brandon stood by her, and, and Mike and Brandon can testify the glory that came. It was overwhelming. His presence came. And we prayed, and I said, Lord, you send your Holy Spirit to her, and she's, she's out cold in a coma, but you speak to her spirit and tell her to live. Tell her she can live. Tell her she can live. And we prayed. So the following week, the same girl comes on Tuesday night, okay, and she shows me a picture of her friend. She's awake. She has a thumbs up. She's going to live. He does what he did yesterday. He still does it today. You understand? And then this week she comes in and says, guess what? She's up and walking now. He, he did that years ago, you know, in the move of God. And guess what? He raised someone from the dead in a prayer at Zion Christian Ministry on a Tuesday night. And most of you missed it because you weren't here. Tuesday night, this Tuesday, the glory showed up. I mean, the glory came. The old man was even dancing. I'm talking about Mike. Anyway, <laughs> I'm telling you, what does it take for us to see that God is wanting to do something? That doesn't happen. We didn't lay hands on her. We believed in Red Bluff, and in Alaska, she's raised from the dead. So why can't he do here what he did in Alaska? Why can't he stir up the people now and do it again and again and again? He knows your heart and your rate and the thoughts and the intent behind them. He's been working on my intent so hard, I don't know if I'm ever going to have a tent. Because I want revival so bad, but I've been cursed by pastors in town because they don't like I'm prophetic. They say that we do weird things here at Zion and bad things happen. They, I mean, we, for a little church, we take up more of the gossip of the church of Jesus Christ than most churches. Praise God. <laughs> Why? 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 Why are people concerned with me? It's not me. I'm Joshua, and the enemy knows it. I remember when I did, heard that word, and I met with a pastor, a friend of mine in Corning. He, who do you think you are? You call yourself out. You think you're the one to lead revival? I didn't know what to say. I just go, oh, do you know that I don't really want to? That's my dead son's name. It hurts me just to think about it. Well, I know. I just heard these things. What things? <laughs> what do you think is going to happen after today? <laughs> 
It's on the internet. <laughs> All I'm telling you is, when God raises the dead, he removes the fog out of a kid's brain, he removes a food allergy, he heals people when they're running around Tuesday night acting like they're 20 years old again. But this is what is about to happen to you. I can do it to her because the devil can't put her to sleep. She's tasted and seen. No one can came, huh? You feel that fire? Yeah, I know. It's all over me. I know. Hold just a second. My wife hates to hear it, but I don't care. Whatever the devil to do against me, do it. Because God's going to be bigger. <laughs> now, you know why they've been, we've had critters talking around our house. See, it's not good when you shave and talk. You can cut yourself. Okay? So my wife's in the other half of the bathroom. She goes, why did you say it ain't going to happen? No, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. I go, I didn't say nothing. Yeah, you did, and we're fighting. <laughs> you said something. No, I didn't. I heard it. I said, I didn't say it. I was shaving. <laughs> what was you saying? It ain't going to work. That freaking lying devil. He only speaks when you kick him in the groin. Serious. Okay? Then I heard him growling before Tuesday night service. I came out and I asked Chrissy, is dog snoring? What's going on? There's noises. It was underneath the house. It was coming from the pit of hell itself. And I, I'm looking. I go out and look. Under, there ain't nothing there. I'm waiting for a raccoon cornered by the dog or something, you know? No. So no one voted for my experiences, so I guess they're not going to come to your house. They just come to mine. <laughs> my wife wants to share. <laughs> he is jealous for you. This battle isn't about you, it's about him. There are men and women in this city who worship darkness and they released an atmosphere over the schools. They released an atmosphere around the community. Okay? And we've had all kinds of fun things happen this week with different people within the church. Because it's getting all kicked up. And you go, well, Pastor, don't, don't stir it up. You know, I've had people say, well, I really love your preaching. I love the worship here. But I'm just not a warfare person. I'm, I don't, I don't want to be in a warfare church. You hear that? What the hell? <laughs> We're at war with hell. We're out to take people out of hell. That's war. And you know what happened? Years later, that woman came back, lost her husband, insane asylum. Kids are all serving devil. Well, I can't be here because my kids might go and get hurt. The best place to be is where God's fighting. The best place to be is where God says, no to the enemy. Happy Mother's Day. So I have no place to go except before him.
No question. So, if you're kind of saying, oh, I, don't, I hate what's going on in my city, I hate what's going on, that's good. But what's your intent of your thoughts? I don't know if I can do it. Well, I can't either. She does it. What's on your mind? He may be working on you right now. What would happen if we began at Zion Christian Ministry releasing atmosphere in a greater way? What if Tuesday night is so full of glory it just runs out on the street? What if Sunday we get in tune with God and the glory comes all over us and then we go out to restaurants like some of you get to do today? because you're not making your wife cook. <laughs> what would happen if you walk into a place so full of God that people begin to manifest demons? Wouldn't that be good? And you know what people say? Don't do that. No, that's the best part of the kingdom. Because then you can pray for them and love them and say, my God, because see, they're not our enemies. They're tormented. They're broken people that God wants to fix. They're not our enemy, church. The critters that bust their heads open and drive them crazy. That's who our enemy is. And we're to love them and release their glory and free them. Oh, we're worried about homeless people. We'll get the critters off of them. He's jealous for you. He has so much passion, I don't understand it. Can I tell that joke on you now? <laughs> We're going to have an altar call, but I, I want to get a father and son on the right page together. Don't, give, don't you protect him. Daniel and I are from a different generation. I've caught this guy praying for rain. <laughs> he was outside when it was sprinkling here dancing a rain dance Daniel I don't know what that means for roofers no rain no I told him I was going to talk to you Daniel you and I will work to straighten him out, okay? <laughs> He's dying right now. He told me, and, and this friend of his said, don't, don't do that. That friend goes, don't do that. Don't hurt Brandon. He prays for rain so he can sleep. Now mom's on the same page. <laughs> the only reason I'm doing this is because Joey didn't get the announcements set up right because the computer's going crazy or we'd have had Brandon on tape. <laughs> it's okay. He's more afraid of his dad than he is of God right now. <laughs> Moms, are you sick and tired of seeing what's going on? Are you sick and tired of seeing things, ladies, go negative in your community? Are you sick and tired of hearing about bad things happening to kids? Are you sick and tired of seeing your children walk away and not serve God? I am. I've lost two in this battle. I don't want you to suffer that pain. I don't want you to suffer. I want you to take ground. So we're going to pray. And she's getting her makeup fixed. 
some. I ain't doing it. Or it's better if you say, One day she will be a mother. And won't it be great that the land will be different if she has her kids? And won't it be good that one day Caitlin is going to be a mother? In the righteousness of God. And won't it be good that the land is healed? Isn't it time? That we enter the fight, Zion Christian Ministries. So he's so happy I didn't do that over his wife. Was it? <laughs> Think of what I said. One day, you're going to have a baby. One day, Joey. I didn't say when. Wouldn't it be good that the land is clean and blessed when your child comes? Wouldn't that be good? So I told her, I'm not going that way any farther. <laughs> Could you stand, please? Now, the reason we go on on Sunday, on Mother's Day, is that when you go out, all the people are out by noon. They're going to be out of the restaurant here in a few minutes. <laughs> If I could express the love I feel he has for you, if somehow I could make you understand this love for you, if there's somehow in the things I experienced the last two or three days to know how much he's sick and tired of hurt and pain, I would do it, but I can't. But I can pray that he does it to you. He loves you. We have a man that prays for this church every day. There's many people do. And he finally let me in on what he believes that God will answer his prayer about Zion Christian Ministries. This man prayed a prayer 35, 40 years ago that he would see God do something with a small church that no one could deny that it would be God and God alone. And he said now he believes the moment has come for a small church to receive the glory and do something that nobody in the world can say was done by man. And that is you. That is you. Holy Spirit, we are not concerned with the principalities and powers. We're concerned for your glory. We're not concerned about the evil and what men do. We're concerned that your name would be exalted almost high. We're not concerned for our own safety, our own wants or desires. We're concerned that your name would be above every name. We're not here to get something from you, Messiah. We're here to serve you. 
were here that your name would be exalted and you would drive the evil out of this land for the glory of your name. And therefore, my king, I rebuke every curse, every witchcraft, sorceries, incantations, and spells against this church, against these people, and against this city. And I ask that you unveil your glory in this house, that you will release an army of lovers of Christ as never before, and that the fullness of who you are would be seen. Now bring this fire into every heart and every soul. May they know if it's a yes, it's in their heart, he will fulfill what your desire is. If you can't make that commitment, don't do it out of guilt, but do it out of grace that he wants to give you. Right now, there is a power and an anointing of heaven that has entered the room. And now may the glory of God be released over these, your children, and you at home, and you who are watching in the future, that you might wake up, O oh, giant church of Jesus Christ, that you might wake up and that the head will wake up to wake up the body from the north in Red Bluff all the way to Porterville and Bakersfield. Lord, you've allowed me now to go back to my root in Bakersfield, and now you brought me back here, and I call out now that this head will stand up, and in Bakersfield the feet shall be planted, and the king shall be king, and the Lord shall be Lord. Holy Ghost, release your plan in this city. Wake up! God says I'm coming! I'm coming with anointing that will break every yoke, every chain, and I will set the captives free. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Forever. His name will reign forever. This city will be a light. It will no longer be a place of death. It shall be light. Holy Ghost, begin to fall upon everyone in this room. Begin to burn in every heart. Begin to melt away the wax of our hearts that the enemy has put over us. And now the veil is torn. And now he says, walk into my glorious throne and receive the anointing that's meant for you. I have made this time for you for such a time as this. I have waited and I will never despise a small thing. I will take a small thing to show forth. And the scripture I did not even speak today that I forgot all Things are possible with God. Luke 1, 37. May it be written on your heart now. May that scripture be written inside you. Psalm 1, John 1, 3, 7. Nothing is impossible with God. Now it may be written, may it be tattooed upon your spirit right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The glory is filling the house. The glory is filling the house. The glory fire has come. He says, now, if you want to touch from Joshua, who has now taken his mantle, he shall now raise an army in you that you will fight on your knees and you will see the glory. And the land will be delivered of every Hittite, every bell, and every rotten thing that is in this land. It shall be cleansed in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar is open.